got to talk. I got to tell what I feel. I got to talk about my life as I see it. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We're here on the corner of Franklin Avenue and St. John's Place in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, this is Team Footprints. Mark Williams here. I'm over here with Big Joe of NYG Hoops. How you doing, sir? I'm all right. How you feeling? I can't complain, man. It's a beautiful day out here. We're going to talk about basketball here in New York City. Um, girls, girls basketball as well as boys basketball we can touch upon. But first and foremost, congratulations on your New York State um, voting uh uh, what do you guys call that? For Miss Basketball? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was a big gift for us because, you know, most of those guys are upstate. They don't really get to see our kids much. You know, it's usually rep mostly represented by the upstate kids. So what, what are you, the eyes and ears for New York um, City, for, for lack of a better phrase? Um, I would just say I, I mean, the eyes and ears for New York in general. And I just love basketball, so I try to keep my eye on everything going on basketball in the Northeast. Okay. So we might have jumped a little bit, but... What exactly is your position um, at uh, NYG? Um, I'm the owner, the publisher. I have a recruiting service, you know, that I actually go out, I watch the kids, and I disseminate information to the colleges. And, um, and that's going well for you? Um, it could always be better, you know, <laughs> you know, but I think it's going well for us. Like uh -huh. When I say us, I mean me, the kids, the state, the right. region, everyone. Um, where do you plan to go from that point uh, as far as hitting all the colleges? Uh, do you do NCAA, NAIA, junior college, prep school, or pretty much everyone? I, I try not to solicit business. I just try to go out and find players. And the more players you actually have in the book of business, I think the more people reach out to you. Okay. Well, how did you get into that field? Um, I, former college football coach. I coach at the school called ASA Downtown Brooklyn. The women's basketball coach, she, um, she continually always asked me to come watch games with her. And one day we start talking about it. And next thing you know, I was just going out watching games and giving her notes. Okay. Wow. So a hobby became a business? Um, I don't call it a business. I just call it having fun, man. <laughs> You know, I worked corporate America. I coached college football for 10 years. I've had kids, all Americans, and I get to play in the NFL. I think that was more like work. Mm -hmm. This, every day I wake up, I look forward to doing what I'm doing. The, the, the challenge to me is finding new players that can play. Right. Okay. Speaking of which, you just wrapped up a very busy summer. Um, but you ended it with like an exposure camp over at um, a local high school. How'd that turn out? Um, I did a camp in the September viewing period. We ended up with over 147 kids from over six or seven states, over 130 Division I coaches, you know, came over to see them. From the feedback that I'm getting around the country, everyone loved the idea, and they just want to know if I'm going to do another one. Uh -huh. hey, do, you, do you see that that is a, um, a big movement as far as um, exposing the young ladies um, to the world as far as exposure camps? I think, you know, in this area, on the girl side, it's, you know, it's very important because most of the evaluators or, or the national scouting services are based in the South, the Midwest, or out West. So, you know, not to say that those guys are biased. They, most of those guys do a great job, but what it is is they tend to know the younger kids right. earlier. So we get represented, but we get represented later in these kids' careers. So sometimes, you know, that affects rankings, right. recruitment, and how people perceive the kids. But I think like when we have something like that, like we had three California teams basically sitting in the gym and they get to see eighth graders uh -huh. or seventh grade. We had a, there was a sixth grader there from Maryland that actually gives a school that doesn't get to see kids from the East Coast a jump and they get on the boards and, you know, it, it helps them later on. Right. I think that's great, but there's a, a, a maybe there's a misnomer. Um, there's a lot of people saying that New York City basketball um, is on decline. Uh, uh, would you agree or disagree overall? I would disagree. I think, you know, basketball as a whole has become more of a business. Like, so it's a little different than what it was in, like, in the 80s. It's even a little different like what it was in the 90s. It's just, you know, there's more business people involved than, you know, really basketball people that can teach and train. It's not that it's a good or a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But it's just, I think, you know, that's the part that, you know, most people, they'll, they'll mix it up. And when they give you the information, they won't give you all of the information. 
if basketball is on a decline, I don't even, I'm not heavy on the boys' side, but I know I went to the Elite 24. There were four New York guys. Do you know right. those? Right, right. I, I work with some of them, yeah. So there was four New York guys. You have a team of 24 and four? Right. Are from New York? So it, I got you. But New York backgrounds? I can't see it on a decline. Okay. Now, from the girl side, I know that we had a couple recent signees um, from New York State, or city at least, um, uh, to major schools. Um, is it, are, we, are, the, are the girls in decline? I, I, From what I can see, I would say no. Christ King's always been the national power. They're still a national power. You know, they currently have three kids going to the ACC, which is one of the top, like, two or three conferences in the country. You know, there's other kids in, within the state that have, you know, signed with BCS. Well, I'm not even going to say BCS schools, but FBS schools. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say it's in a decline. I just think, you know, are there, like, Sue Birds and Shamika mm -hmm. Hall squads? Not at the present time, but, mm -hmm. you know, but there are still great players that, in New York. Okay. Um, now, you, you traveled. How do how do the New York players stack up against some of the girls throughout? I know that Pennsylvania has a pretty big tournament, and Kentucky has a big tournament, and Tennessee. I, I tell you this. There's tournaments all over the country, but I don't know a tournament director that doesn't want a New York team in his tournament. Right. So when you start saying, hey, New York is in a decline, you know, it, it's a funny thing that – that you're saying it's in the decline, but yet everyone wants a New York team. Uh -huh. Hold up one second. No problem. I'm going to take this call from this AU coach. No problem. Hey, what's up, Thomas? Hey, give me one second. I'm going to call you right back. All right. We can start And we're live again. All right, all right. <laughs> I just took a call from um, the, the Nike program, one of the Nike programs in New York. They're, they're director Thomas Davis from Exodus. Uh-huh. You know, like I said, like, it's just... There's not a, someone that's having an event that don't want a New York team there. So when you look at the, I think the biggest problem is is less influencers in New mm -hmm. York. Like, like if you look back, like I, I'm gonna you know step out of step out a little bit. You know this isn't my my expertise, but I do know the boys game. There's some guys you read about them and you're like, this guy didn't play high school basketball. Right, and right. He's in the pros. Right. So someone made a call uh -huh. and got the guy to college. I just think this. There's less of those people involved in girls' basketball right now. They can actually pick up the phone and get kids scholarships. And they're more businessmen. Right. And, and when you say they're more businessmen, they're looking out for their their interest, the sneaker company interest, or the, the, the kid? Well, it's just business. I don't think that they, they no one really, I don't think no one gets involved and say, hey, I'm going to hurt a kid, right. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But at the end of the day, you know, everything is business. So you have an AAU team, it's usually a non-for-profit, that mm -hmm. has a chair, has a board, mm -hmm. that has a, a, probably an office space or something that, you know, they have overhead. Mm -hmm. So I used to think it's a, more of a business as opposed to, like, when you look back at, like, Brooklyn, USA. Mm -hmm. um, you look back at the Coney Island Flames. Mm -hmm. You look back at those little teams with mom-and-pop situations that they were teaching kids or aim high out in Queens. Mm -hmm. They were teaching kids. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't about the business part. Kids weren't really traveling all over the country to play, you know, you just want to be the best on your block. You right. want to stay on the court. Right. I agree. I, that's funny you say that because we just talking to some guys about when we grew up, we had to go to the park. If you if you lost, you might as well go home because there was so many people out there and it was so competitive. And that's where kids got their competitive spirit from. Um, do you see any kids playing pickup ball anymore? You're here, you're here in Brooklyn. Now, I don't have many courts over here on this side of Brooklyn, but uh, anybody playing pickup? I, you seldomly see it. I think that's kind of like one of the biggest things in New York right now. I think, like, you know, outside of us not having influences, we don't have kids in the park. Right. Like, you know, like before you, like, and this is just me being a basketball junkie. I can remember being in the eighth grade, hearing the Kenny Anderson's playing in the park and trying to figure out the train map to get there to, right. get there right. to go right. see it. So, you know, I, I don't think it's too much more of that now uh -huh. it's like so if, if you hear of a person playing there's a cost associated to it mm -hmm. you have to go to a gym to see him mm -hmm. but that's not kind of like how i grew up uh -huh. or even like you know my freshman year in college i remember coming home you know training in the morning for football and getting to rucker park at two uh -huh. for a six o'clock game to get online yeah. to see ali mo uh -huh. cream reed to see those type guys but it's just, I think it's a different time and a different era. Like, it doesn't matter what time I'm sure you get there now. Like, right. You don't have a corporate sponsor, you're not going to get a good seat. Right, right, right. It's the business. Yeah, it's, it's more of a business. Right. Um, 
as far as New York City girls basketball, the future, I know that there's some talk that the 2019 class is supposed to be pretty good for New York City. The 19 is bananas. You know, there's a kid from Exodus, Lauren Hanson, that's tremendous. Christ the King has a, a Clark kid. They have a Stabberfield kid. And it, there's a, there's, there's like, I, I can go on, there's a Heaps kid upstate. Um, there's a Tuckus kid upstate. There, there's a lot of kids in the 19 class. Uh -huh. You know, the key thing is those kids just got to stay humble, keep working, and, you know, whatever basically got them their skill sets, they just got to refine other parts of their game. Uh-huh. I, I, I seen the side of the field, young lady. Um, she's going to be a problem. She's really good. Her dad is um, Kenny Statterfield right. that actually played at Cincinnati. He was a McDonald's right. owner. Got the he played in, in, in the NBA. Yes, he did, yeah. You know, so she comes from pretty good pedigree. Um, every time you see her, she picks up something new. Now right. she's got that Kyrie Irving spin with the spin, spin with the uh -huh. ball. Saw her knocking down some three-pointers the other day. Like, like I said, like these, these kids, they're working on getting better. Uh-huh. I just think, like, you know, like I said, it's just more like who's going to put the word out there to say, hey, this kid can play. Right. And who are people going to trust? Because right. it's more of a business now, and not too many people are worried about this. Like, if the kid don't play for me, I don't promote this. Right, right, right. It's so, one of those things. So it's back to the influences uh, in New York City that we're lacking, is what you're saying. That That's what I see, you know, like outside of it just being a business, but it's a business all over the country. I just think, you know, more influences, like, people, like, you get more people that can pick up the phone and get kids schools. Mm -hmm. Sight unseen. Sight, well, it doesn't have to be sight unseen because, you know, on that end, it's a business, too, for them. Right. But, you know, you tell them, they come see the kid. Uh -huh. Now, if the kid is an apple, they're an apple. Right. You tell them they're apple, you know, then they, you build a trust, and they see <laughs> they see what the kid really is. But I, but I think that's the major thing right now with, with basketball in New York. Because I'm sure if I asked you to pull out a list of 16s, mm -hmm. You can pull out a few kids that can play low D1 low, mid major. Right, right. Like, I think it's a misconception because we keep, we keep going back. We say basketball's in decline and decline. Like, who was the who was the last lottery pick out of New York? Uh, Bassy. You know, but people act like before him there was like who was thousand, before him? Right, yeah. They're not thousands, you know. Like, we get kids well represented in terms of. Rankings, but at the end of the day, all the rankings, all the rankings, die, oh, die all, right, 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 like, like, what was the guy, Jamal Timsel? I don't, you know, like, he, he wasn't he, yeah, he, I, from what I understand, he didn't play high school basketball, right? Got a great pro career, you know, like, and there's been, I think, more guys like that in the NBA from New York, uh huh, than any, anything else. But I'm sure if you, you dig into a lot of these guys, there's a lot of guys that, you know, that'll make it to the pros. They're not going to be lottery picks from the New York area or New York, strong New York backgrounds right. that, you know, people are not accounting for. So, like, like, like what's the kid that just left Christ to K to go to a prep school? What's uh, his name? Uh, uh, Raleigh. So, when it's all said and done, will he go down as a New York guy or North Carolina guy? I don't know. That's a big debate. I know that many people said he was born in, or, or spent former, his formative years here. So he's a New York guy, but he's really um, Florida. Now he came up here, and then he's down in North Carolina. So, but that—that's I think that's the most, that's the thing right now with most players. Right. Like so, I remember what was the kid Corey Fisher. Where was he from? Bronx. Where did he go to school? Jersey. So was he a Jersey guy? Is he a New York guy? If you dig into roots, a lot of guys are, Bro are New York guys. Right. I'm not gonna say Brooklyn guys. But, and I think that's the misconception. And you know, and I think another misconception is like the sneaker company. Uh -huh. Like, I just think like when you go back to it, if you, like, I, I can remember growing up, Rice was with a sneaker company, St. Raymond's was with a sneaker company, or Hollows was with a sneaker company, LaSalle was with a sneaker company. I'm not sure if Lachlan was with a sneaker company. I remember them winning the States when uh -huh. I was a freshman. Um, Lincoln, I don't know, if, I think they were. Um, Grady, uh -huh. like if you, if the sneaker companies would invest more in the schools and the schools would be able to, to hire qualified coaches. Uh -huh. But if, if it's the thing, if there's no sneaker company, the sneaker money give, gives the money to the AAUs, the AAUs don't necessarily have to teach, right. just go out, pick what you want. So I think that kind of hurts in terms of like, think of it like this, like we're right here in Crown Heights, there's two high schools, two blocks away. Is um, Clara Barton 
and there's um, Prospect right, Heights. Right, right. If both those schools are sponsored and funded, and they both have 10 kids that can actually play in them, mm -hmm. now it's more for the AU to pick from. But if none of them, they're not getting money, why should kids even go oh, there? Yeah. They're going to pick and choose where they want to go, and their right. handlers are going to make sure they go to situations where their handlers don't have to worry about their high school coaches creating AAU teams. Right. So, would well, you say that's why we have a um, a couple superpowers in New York City basketball? You, you, you can always count on CK being um, pretty good every year, both boys and girls. It's like a factory. Uh, uh, Lachlan, um, to a certain extent. I know for the girls, side, they're doing very well. It's another sneaker company um, South Shore, who just won the States. It's another sneaker company team. Um, Wings. Um, they were another better. sneaker company team. Uh, who else did well this year? Uh, I know perennial boys and girls. And, and, sneak company and, team. and, and uh, Jeff. Sneak Jefferson. Sneak company team. Uh, Lincoln. Sneak Lincoln, company yeah. team. Uh, like, on so, the girls side. Uh, uh, St. Anthony's. On uh, Long Island, yeah. Sneak company team. Right. Lou High. Sneak, sneak company team. Right. So we can go on and go on. I think... If you provide the infrastructure, and I think you, if you're giving someone something, it's easier for them to build around it. Mm -hmm. But if there's nothing, it's harder for you to build. Because now you have coaches that are not really coaches, assistants that are not really assistants. Right. Because you're not providing nothing. No incentive. No incentive. Got you. And would you say that's one of the misconceptions in New York City? How about um, the prep school? Or moving out of, out, of, out of New York City? I don't really know much about it, but I would say this. The, the kids, you know, they, they they go to a prep school. If it can better their education, it can help them. You know, that's what, I guess, this, that's what, not I guess, that's what it's all about. Right. Furthering education and figuring out ways. But the thing you always hear is there's too many distractions in New York. Right. I, I find that hard to believe because... Usually, if there's all those distractions, how come those same kids come back in the summer and those distractions are not in their way? Right. They make all their games. Uh -huh. Like, in the summertime, you know? So, it's... I just think people pick and choose. Like, if a kid's going to somewhere because it's just a better situation, like a kid, you know, you live in a one-bedroom, six people there, and uh -huh. it makes sense. Uh -huh. Or, you know, you're very poor, you get an opportunity to go rub elbows with rich people, someone teach you how to... Live. That makes okay. sense. But I... but. Just to go somewhere to play basketball, that I don't, you know. I got you. Now, now, one thing before we're going to distinguish the boys and the girls, um, academically, um, to go back to your distractions, um, it seems like the, 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 the girls are doing better academically across the board than the guys. Is there a particular reason for that? Well, that, that's a funny question because if you if you pull up grades at any high school, it, it always seems like the girls are doing better than boys. Right. I don't like I, said, I don't follow it closely, but it seems like they always make it right. if they stay. Like, didn't Wings have two kids last year? Uh, one went to Georgetown and one went to Hofstra. Georgetown's a pretty hard school to get into. Yeah, you know Hofstra's they play competitive hey. basketball. You right. Know? So like, didn't Lincoln a few years ago have two? Like. And these are public schools. Right. They so, had uh, two in the Seton Hall. So I just, like I said, I just think it's a thing where, where like, the kids are going to, you know, like, if, if, if it's met and they want to do what they got to do, they're going to get it done. Like, right. It's not the schools. It's not the system. It's not distractions. It's, it's, them. it's just if they want to get it done, they're going to get it done. How many kids go to prep school and then don't end up in college? I'm sure a lot. I'm sure more than enough in college. I'm sure. No, not I'm sure because it's a new fad with this prep school. I need to reclassify. I right. need to do this. I need. They're going to all these prep schools and they end up in JUCOs. Yeah. So what's or, the fad? Or, or I'll give you one. The kid that was a D2 kid when he left public school goes to prep school and he's still a D2 kid. Yeah. <laughs> so what did he or she necessarily gain? She, um, on the girl side, it's not that predominant. You know, it's like the girls, it is what it is. Right. Like, usually, like, if they're feeling a Division One kid, they fight it out till the very end. Mm -hmm. And by June, May, like, all right, there's, there's money on the table. I'm going to take this D2. Right. I got you. So we're going to move away. We're going to move to the future. Um, what's the ultimate goal of your company? Um, Just keep finding kids. The, the key is to find, well, how I got into it is just find kids. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and to become a voice where you can actually help kids get scholarships, help people recognize kids and see kids. I don't rank the kids because, like, the one thing, I, you don't realize what a kid has in their heart. Right. 
So I don't rank. I just go out, find the players, and that's it. Um, in your time, the best player that you've seen in New York, New York City, girls. My time. In the last few years, I would say, you know, Bianca Cuevas and um, Sierra Calhoun. You know, like I, I think they were probably hands down two of the best in New York City. You know, throughout the state, mm -hmm. like Brianna Stewart, like uh, Syracuse area, Cicero, yeah, uh, like she was dominant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Mabry kid out of Jersey, um, Zaire O'Neal out of Jersey. Like, there's been a lot of great ones. Really, I just think what it is is you just don't. As you're watching it sometimes, you don't realize how great they are. You see them so much uh -huh. that you don't really pay too much attention to it. But once they're gone and you see them doing it as freshmen in college right, or right. just you're like, wow, that one was a special. It was a good one. But, you know, I would say in the last five years for sure, Bianca and, and, and Calhoun. Yeah. And Sanaya Chung. Uh, UConn. Uh, yeah. Austin. Yeah. Austin. She was like a scoring machine. Right. Um, and that's funny you say that only because it turned out they both turned out to be McDonald's All Americans. Well, tonight Chung was it, but she was a WBCA All American, uh -huh. and um, and I think she was like the Gatorade National Player of the Year. State? She was no National Player. Of the Year. I think she was a National Player of the Year on one of the publications. Really? Yeah. You know, you didn't hear about it much, but. Wow, well, that's, that's impressive. Yeah, like 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 basketball is not dead in New York. Right. Like, I don't think it's dead. If it was dead, coaches wouldn't show up for stuff. Right. Um, people that have events wouldn't want teams to, come up here. Yeah, yeah. to show up. How many coaches you had at your event? I would say about 130. Like, you know, in Division One. So they're looking for the next stud. Well, it, it's not. I, I just think, like, people come to New York, it's not just about the stud. Like, you know, the same things we complain about are the things that people love. Like, you were an AD at a school. Uh -huh. Did you have a training room in your school? No. When a kid had a sprained ankle, it's either can you go or you can't. Yeah. And that's what the coaches come here for, that toughness. The kids are not going to sit on the quiche and wait for the trainer to clear them. Right. You won't even know what's wrong. Oh, so true. <laughs> yeah, you know, you won't even know what's wrong. So it's just, I think that's what people come here for. They don't want a team full of New York kids. Right. They want one or two. It provides a certain edge, a certain toughness, a kid that can be coached. Uh -huh. And, you know, kids that can improvise. Like, whether with the ball in their hand or just period. Right. Like, they figure if, it out. Yeah, if the trainer can't take it in, you figure out what bus <laughs> takes you there. Or dollar cab. <laughs> They're going to figure it out. That's New York, baby. All right, so a quick question. A last one. Parting shots or parting words for... Um, uh, players, coaches, schools, it could be high schools, prep schools, junior college, NAI, NCAA, D1, D2. Do you have anything to, to give as far as insight? The one thing I would tell players now is like, I know you're a trainer, you might get mad at me, but I think kids are putting too much emphasis on training. You know, you should train, and I think all these kids, boys and girls, just find a park. Find a park and compete. You know, iron sharpens iron. And as we talked about, it, it creates a competitive advantage, a competitive edge. And I just think that's lacking right now. No, like, I, I, no I'm, uh, I'm not going to get angry with you. I'm actually going to agree with you. And because, I think that what I do and what we do at Team Footprints is a shadow boxing. Mm -hmm. and, and that you're you're not necessarily playing. You're going against cones or an invisible man or a, a young lady. You get better when you, when you get, in, lack of a better phrase, you're getting your ass bust. Uh, and, and that's how you really get better and learn. Like how, how I, I look at it more like training is basically studying. And, you the know, game is a test. The game is a test. So, I, you know, if we, and as we talk about that, I just think that that's become a problem where kids are taking more tests now than they're actually studying. Uh -huh. So you get kids that are playing in 50 games throughout AAU, but barely practice, uh -huh. barely train. Uh -huh. So, they don't really see the importance of the exam. Damn, right. So when they pass two, oh, I had 50, I did this, uh -huh. I did that, I lost it. What happened to the other 49? Uh -huh. And it, it also demagnetized the kids to winning and losing. Uh -huh. Like, it's a weird dynamic. I think if kids can, the more chance they get to just compete and play five on five, three on three, or even Utah. Like, I don't uh, think people play that. No, 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 you know, no, no. just create, 
these skills that'll help you when you get on the stage. I, I, I think as far as um, not to take off your 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 your, part, your um your points um when you lose at one and you know you have a game at five, it really doesn't. Nah, you go to the pool and yeah. get ice cream. <laughs> yeah. You're cool with pool. it. All right, gotta get ready at four. Start getting ready for the game at five. That's it. And I just think like, and that's the difference when you look at the high, high, high caliber kids. The high, high, high caliber kids, they have the same kitty mentality as the other kids. But like the ones that are serious about it, they realize, yo, I'm ranked 75. Mm -hmm. I get four or five bad ones. Right. I might be out the top 100. 100 right. So everyone kind of, they, they, they kind of pay attention to it more. Uh -huh. And I just think that's the difference. But I just think there's so many, still there's still so many good players in New York uh -huh. that like the, the rankings don't really matter. Like whether you like how many guys are ranked and you you can go to a game and you'll watch you'll get some business from, uh -huh. from a guy you don't even know who the guy is yep there's a lot of good competitive tough players in New York I agree but I just think you know what it, like I said it's a business and now that it's a business it's just handled differently uh -huh. not that it's wrong not that it's right but it's just it is what it is and basketball's become more of a business as a whole as a whole think of it like you coming up? How many? A what were the main AU teams when oh, you were coming up? Chose, Gau uh, Gauchos, Riverside, uh, Aim High, Brooklyn USA, Broncos. Uh, that's all I can remember. But I know this: like, if a guy had a Gauchos book bag, yeah, he was a man. Or a Riverside book bag, but now you can buy those online. Yeah, and that's what I mean by it's a business. So you could have a Gauchos book bag, and never put on a shirt. But I, I remember dudes, like, from my neighborhood, like, they would get cut. They'd spend 364 days trying to get better to make the team the next year. Now they create their own team. Yeah, so you get guys, like, you play in West 4th. <laughs> then you go play in, um, so, no, was it Soul in the Hole? D&D. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. You go do this. And this is all in one, two days. You go play on 55th and Forster. Uh -huh. You're playing three, four games a day. It wasn't you playing around the country. You're trying to get buckets in every park, uh -huh. create a name for yourself. Uh -huh. And I just think that's the difference. Like, I know you work with Charles Jones. I don't know him personally, but I kind of know the story. Uh -huh. And when you look at it, like, when he was coming out, I think around the time Felipe and those guys were coming out. But seldom known story. He led the city in scoring. Led the country at LIU later. No, in scoring, right. yeah, right. but no one really understands that. But he went to Bishop Ford. Those guys went to the big power. Right. But it wasn't that he couldn't play at those big schools. Right. But he originally signed with Rutgers. He was Rutgers, right? You know what I mean? So it's just like this a lot of great players and good players. It's just back then, like, I guess Mr. Nash, uh -huh. even Petey Gecko that's still involved, those guys can do things that now I think there's less people that can actually do those same things, but that's not their ultimate goal. Their goal right. is to run a company. company. right. Like all those other guys, you know, their main jobs were at the school. Uh -huh. Like now you get guys, that the school job is like the secondary job because there's so much more in line financially doing other things. Right, gotcha. No, I, I, and it's not a bad thing because they are able to provide for their families. They're sometimes able to provide for everyone involved. I got you. Anything else? Uh, any more questions? Uh, 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 so where can someone find you? Um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at NYG Hoops or Joseph Fennel at AOL.com. There you go. And, and and for lack of a better phrase, he's the guru of New York City girls basketball. <laughs> he's a humble guy. Um, but uh, we're going to uh, tune off right now. We're currently, again, at Franklin Ave and St. John's Place in Brooklyn, New York. Crown Heights. Or what's the new name of Crown Heights now? Oh, Prospect Heights. I don't oh. know what Crown Heights <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Enjoy. Later. There you have it. Another New York City mover and shaker. Thank you for tuning in to this podcast. This is Mark Williams, Footprints Basketball, the Mecca.